that I didn't have time for yesterday, and then we'll go on with uh, lambda calculus. So um, here's a, a useful one. I'm not going to say too much about it, but just to let you know that it's here. Uh, Koch has lots of uh, specialized built-in tactics uh, or uh, library tactics that people have contributed. Uh, one of them is a library called um, Omega uh, that implements uh, Bill Pugh's Omega decision procedure for Pressburger arithmetic. And so it's quite convenient if you have, uh, if you find yourself with kind of simple arithmetic constraints and you're annoyed doing all of the low-level uh, arithmetic manipulation, try Omega. Uh, okay, here's a few more just to mention them quickly. Um, clear uh, deletes a hypothesis from the context. That's useful if you've already used it and you're tired of looking at it. You just want to simplify things. Uh, subst with a variable name uh, just substitutes away that variable without uh, clearing out the other equalities in the context. Uh, subst with no variable name is useful after like, a, uh, like an inversion that's generated a whole pile of um, equalities that you don't want to think about. Uh, rename is useful if uh, some automatic tactic has chosen a bad variable name for something. So, uh, so it's a kind of uh, post hoc uh, as. Uh, assumption, we saw once a couple of days ago, uh, is a tactic that looks in the local hypotheses for something that can be um, applied to solve the goal. Uh, contradiction is similar. Uh, it, um, uh, it looks in the local hypotheses for something contradictory, something, uh, something equivalent to false, and solves the goal if so. Uh, and uh, constructor is, um, is a simple one that, uh, that uh, looks around in all currently available inductive definitions and sees if there's some constructor that can be applied uh, at this point. Okay, so <coughs> these are all uh, uh, pretty easy to use and there are a whole bunch of others that you'll find kind of as you go along reading other people's scripts and so on. Uh, but we're now getting on toward a fairly complete set. In a few minutes I'll come back and talk about just a couple more um, substantially more powerful uh, automation techniques. But first, let's quickly finish up the, um, uh, the treatment of imp. So uh, remember we had um, uh, this little, little imperative language. We had arithmetic expressions, Boolean expressions, and then commands. We were in the middle of uh, defining the semantics of uh, arithmetic expressions. So we had given the semantics as a, uh, as a fixed point and then we got uh, drawn off onto this uh, side topic of proving that the optimization uh, was correct uh, and then noticed that it would be nice to have a little automation for that. So coming back to the mainstream, uh, here is uh, evaluation presented as an inductively defined relation as opposed to a fixed point. Uh, and you know, there's not too much to say about it. It's just, uh, it's, a, it's a scheme for, let's, let's take a little look at it. It's a scheme for uh, the, <coughs> the way kind of all inductive definitions uh, of inductively defined relations are going to look. So first of all, uh, one little notational trick is we've seen that we can define something and then, and then afterwards define a notation for it. Uh, with these complicated inductive definitions, that's a little bit unfortunate because you, ha you have to give this big long definition uh, in terms of the low level notation, which you're never again going to use. But, uh, but now every time you, you have to refer back to this big definition, you're seeing it in terms of uh, the wrong notation. So what you can do to fix that is use this reserved notation uh, trick. So you, you first declare the notation, you, uh, you kind of reserve a place for it in the parser. Uh, you then give the definition using the new notation without yet having said what it means, and then at the bottom of the definition you say where and specify what it means. Uh, so this is useful. Um, okay, so aside from that, I'm not sure what, 
what there is to say here. So this is a uh, notice that here all of the parameters, both of the parameters to the uh, to the inductive definition, are non-uniform ones. Uh, why? Because well, they're non-uniform because uh, because in each of the clauses, in each of the rules uh, forming this inductive definition, the uh, the arithmetic expression to be evaluated and the number that it evaluates to are different. Um, okay, so not too much more to say about that. Uh, then, as usual, so this will be the standard pattern uh, all the way through, we define ourselves a little A of L R uh, cases uh, so that we can easily do inductive proofs. So, um, I think probably all of the, uh, every year there are a couple of people from the cock team kind of hanging around. So I always like to plant the seed, uh, so just in case there's anybody in the room. This should be built in. It's silly to have to do this every time. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, uh, Alexandra uh, Pilkiewicz uh, made a beautiful uh, plug-in for, a beautiful extension for cock that handles all of this completely automatically and, uh, and is wonderful and beautiful. And the COC team has so far chosen to ignore it, and they should not. Uh, okay, so we can prove theorems about this. So here's the kind of long version of the theorem. And then if you want a little exercise, I'm sure you have plenty, but uh, if you want an extra, uh, it's, a, it's a nice um, little exercise with uh, tactics to crunch this down. <clears throat> to something more like what you would uh, what you would write informally. Okay, but let's go on uh, and finish the definition of uh, of imp. Um, so so what's left? So so we had kind of bare arithmetic expressions, and we didn't bother dealing with variables before. So let, let's now add variables to the arithmetic expressions. Uh, we do that by uh, okay. So the the top definition. Is, uh, worth talking about for a minute. Um, so essentially, that top definition is making ID a synonym for, or uh, not quite a synonym, but uh, is making another type that is isomorphic to the type nat. Right? So it's just wrapping an extra constructor around it. Uh, why would we do that? Same reason we would do it in, uh, in Haskell or ML, abstraction. So. Uh, so I'm going to use numbers as my identifiers, uh, just to avoid the silliness of getting involved with the cock string library and all of that. So I'm just going to use numbers as my identifiers, but I don't want to confuse these numbers with other numbers that are not identifiers, and I don't want them to show up as just nat uh, when I'm looking at, uh, at some expression. I'd like them to show up as ID. So let's create a fresh type uh, wrapping up a nat as an ID. Uh, and then all the things that I used to do with NATs, like test them for equality, I need to define new versions of, so there's a little bit of overhead. Uh, but, uh, but once that overhead is finished, um, I can just use them as their own thing. And by the way, uh, I'm not going to say anything about this at all except tell you that it exists. Uh, a Haskell programmer looking at something like this would say, well, Defining a new name, BEQID, is very silly here. We should just have BEQ, and it should be a type class, uh, and, uh, and uh, ID and NAT and everything else should be instances of it, and you can do all that in Coq. Um, the reason that the SF notes are not written that way is twofold. One, uh, that uh, all of this stuff was started before type classes were added to Coq. Uh, so it would require going back and changing. And then uh, second, we haven't felt motivated to do the change because uh, type classes are one more thing to explain. And some of the people that, uh, that we teach using this material are complete newbies and have no idea even about functional programming. So that seems like a little bit too much extra overhead. For you guys, we should just start with it the type class way because, uh, because it would make perfect sense. Okay, uh, now we need to represent memories. Uh, there are different choices here, and they all work, but this is a perfect illustration of uh, uh, a general truth about 
not just talk, but any kind of mechanization of mathematics, um, is that uh, little details about low-level choices make an enormous difference in how easy or hard it is to get work done. So, so here, for example, uh, we've chosen a representation, a, a functional representation, where the memory is a total function from identifiers to numbers. Uh, and uh, other alternatives would be possible, so we could have a, uh, we could have an A-list representation or uh, lots of other ones that you could think of. Uh, and we have tried those, uh, and they all work. You can, you can, get, you can get to your goal, uh, but this one is uh, quite a bit smoother and cleaner uh, for low-level reasons that I don't actually even remember anymore. But, uh, but, the, but the, the point is that if you try it a different way, if you try it a particular way and find that you're, uh, you're doing a lot of uh, uh, kind of low-level plumbing that's annoying you, try changing the, uh, the definitions. Keep looking for uh, the optimal definitions for, uh, for doing the, uh, the reasoning that you want, <coughs> rather than just take the definitions that you had on paper, transcribe them into Coq, and, uh, and try to power your way forward. Uh, that will work, but at the cost of uh, very much unnecessary pain. Uh, okay, and then, uh, and then we need some little lemmas that say, uh, that say, you know, if, we, if you store something in the state and then look up that variable, you get the value that you stored and several other similar things. Okay, now we're ready for, uh, now we can add uh, the variables back into the syntax of terms, of uh, arithmetic expressions, uh, and redo the evaluator. Uh, and that's it. That's it for the expression part. Now we can do the command part. And I'm going through this, this fairly quickly because I think uh, at the level of the programming language part, none of it is, uh, is very surprising. But uh, so here are, here are commands at the top, uh, the usual com cases. At the bottom of the screen uh, is a little bit of notation. So here we, we did uh, put a little bit of time into kind of figuring out what was the least horrible way to, um, uh, to make uh, Coq parse expressions that look sort of like while programs. You'll notice that the arithmetic and Boolean expressions that are embedded in them uh, don't have like binary operators for plus and things like that. In previous versions, we did try to do that and we eventually ripped it out, it got too ugly. So um, because, for example, like what identifier would you use for plus? Well, you can't use plus because that's the one for numbers. Uh, okay, maybe plus plus? No, that's used too. Okay, plus plus plus? Well, yes, but <coughs> now it's starting to look like diminishing returns. That's right. So, uh, so one thing you can do uh, if you really care about uh, about having nice notations, uh, important. So, uh, so we didn't we didn't go that far. But one thing you can do is uh, the the notations in Coq are scoped, uh, and you can define name. You can define your own new scopes, uh, and then uh, and then you can tell the parser. Now I'm going into this kind of scope, uh, and it will interpret the notations in that way instead of whatever. Uh, whatever way you uh, had said by default. Yeah, so thank you, that, that is useful. All right. Yes? Uh, overwriting notation is pretty hard in my experience. In general, I, I don't consider myself a, a super expert in the notation aspect of Coq. And, and also not in many other aspects of Coq. Uh, but uh, I have, I, I'm sure you could drive it harder than I have if you really, really cared. Uh, but I have found it pretty painful to, uh, to work with when I've tried, so I tend to stay with pretty simple things. Uh, okay, now we need evaluation. And the story here is pretty simple. 
you can start with trying to define evaluation as a fixed point, and you quickly realize, oh, this is one of the cases where fixed points don't work so well. Why? Because evaluation in this language is not a total function. So now you can play all sorts of games. If you really care about it being a fixed point, you can play various games. So you can, uh, I think probably the best way to do it is to um, step index it. I use that term advisedly. Uh, so what I mean is you can, uh, you can add an extra argument to the evaluation function, uh, which is a number, uh, which, uh, which is used as fuel basically for the evaluator. Uh, and so you, uh, so you start the evaluator and you give it a certain amount of gas, right? I'm, I'm giving you 100,000 units of gas. Uh, and, uh, and each time it makes a recursive call, it subtracts one from the gas. Uh, and so, so now it's obviously terminating. Uh, but of course it may run out of gas. And now you have to decide, well, what's it going to do when it runs out of gas? So it could like return a stupid answer, like return five always. Uh, that would not be very good. So then, so then you say, okay, well, let's make it return an option and it can return none if it runs out of gas. Now you start having to rewrite your evaluator with a lot of plumbing in it uh, to deal with these options. You have, to, you have to rewrite it in a monadic style. Uh, and so, so none of it is very satisfactory. So the nice way to do it is just to forget about all of that and write it as a relation. And there it is. Okay, so I think that is all. That is all I want to say about imperative programs. Um, and at this point, I'm actually going to uh, skip around a bit. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to skip some chapters. Let me give you a, a little overview, those of you that haven't found this already. Uh, here is the whole chapter dependency diagram for the whole book. So we've been through this part. Uh, and now, uh, and now we, we were looking at IMP. Uh, and at this point, uh, if I were teaching a full semester course, um, especially to newbies, uh, we would uh, stay with IMP for a while. We would talk about program equivalences uh, and, uh, and then define whore logic for IMP. Uh, and, uh, and there are even a couple of optional topics there. You can extend imp with lists and then you have some more interesting programs to do horologic proofs about and so on. Uh, I'm going to completely ignore all of that stuff, um, but now you know it's there in case you want to have a look yourselves. Uh, the, the next topic after that kind of in a straight line from imp uh, is a chapter called small step, uh, which I am going to completely skip today. Uh, but which you may want to go back and have a look at if, uh, if the uh, relationship between big step semantics and small step semantics is something that you wonder about. Uh, that is all uh, carefully detailed in that chapter. So, uh, so you know, it takes, uh, I think for arithmetic expressions, kind of does the whole thing in, uh, in tremendous detail. Here's the, here's the big step version, here's the small step version. What's the theorem that relates them, and so on. Okay, and then, uh, and then we go on to talking about types. So there's a chapter called just types, uh, which I'm going to mostly skip. There's a little bit of stuff in there about further automation, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but then I'm going to skip the rest of it, which is just uh, talking about a kind of simplest possible type system a type system with two types, nat and bool, for, uh, for uh, simple expressions. Okay, so that, that would bore you guys, I think. Uh, so I'm going to skip over it and go instead to the simply typed lambda calculus. The simply typed lambda calculus, of course, itself is much simpler than the systems that we've been dealing with and proving things about uh, for many days and that you guys are, are mostly very used to anyway. But uh, but that's the chapter where I want to spend the rest of this lecture. Um, not because the system is so uh, scintillating in itself, but because 
uh, it's a good example. It's, it's finally a, a sort of at scale example of using Coq to formalize facts about a programming language. So, uh, so we'll go through that chapter uh, fairly carefully and then uh, use whatever time is left at the end to, uh, to try some of the bigger proofs together. Okay, so that's my plan for today. Just to show you the rest of what's uh, in the book, since we're looking at, uh, at the dependency diagram, over here we have, um, so there's a chapter called More STLC, uh, where, uh, that shows how to add like products and sums and, uh, and records and all, uh, all the kind of stuff that you would want in a programming language that isn't in <coughs> the raw lambda calculus. So that, that shows how to add that stuff. Uh, and then a chapter on type checking, uh, which develops a, uh, a type checking algorithm <coughs> for the, the simply typed lambda calculus and show <coughs> excuse me, shows that it's correct. Uh, then a chapter on uh, references showing how to, uh, how to, how to have uh, store typings and uh, types for references a la ML. Uh, and then some chapters on kind of more advanced typing features, subtyping in particular, then uh, records and then records with subtyping. Uh, then along the way there are some optional chapters that we've skipped. So first of all up here, uh, there's a chapter which I think I'll talk about a little bit tomorrow, uh, which is a parser for imp. Uh, so nothing very much is proved in there, but, uh, but it's interesting as an example of just programming using Cox, uh, somewhat, somewhat limited functional language uh, and, uh, and fleshing out kind of the going toward the, uh, the concrete syntax part of the front end of an interpreter. Uh, and then uh, uh, this imp c of alpha uh, shows you some of these tricks, like the trick with uh, uh, a fixed point for evaluation for imp uh, using this extra fuel parameter. And then PE is a, a little uh, chapter on partial evaluation. The, the yellow means that uh, this is a contributed chapter. This is a chapter that was written by somebody other than the main group of authors. Uh, and um, uh, just kind of added as a, uh, as a user contribution, as it were, um, to the book. There are some other contributed chapters that are useful. So norm is uh, a chapter on normalization for the simply typed lambda calculus. I think Amal mentioned it yesterday. Uh, uh, following basically Tate's method, uh, but um, uh, but adapted to the Koch setting, uh, and this was contributed by Andrew Tolmach. Uh, and, uh, and then these two chapters uh, on the right were contributed by Arthur Chagero, uh, and these are, these are more extended uh, uh, tutorials on how to use the, uh, the tactic features, uh, tactic programming, uh, and his kind of slightly fancier uh, tactic library and then, uh, and then a, a whole chapter on how to use the auto feature, which we'll talk about today. Okay, so this is just by way of telling you everything that's there uh, in case you want to have a look at it further. All right, so going back to where we were. Let's look at this types chapter. Okay, so we're not really going to look at types. We're going to look at just the, uh, the automation stuff. <coughs> um, the auto tactic is uh, Koch's most fundamental tactic for doing proof search. And what it does is basically uh, uh, exhaustively explores all possible proof trees uh, involving only the following uh, tactics. Intros, apply, and reflexivity. 
even its use of apply is limited. So by default, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's willing to apply only things from the local context, not uh, arbitrary theorems uh, from the library and so on. Um, so it, it's, it's willing to deal with conditional statements by putting things into the context. Uh, it's willing to apply things from the context and it's willing to use reflexivity and that's all it does. It can be extended a little bit, I'll show you in a minute. But, uh, but basically, uh, that's its, its core behavior. And it just exhaustively searches to some depth. I think the default is like five. Uh, you can ask it to search a little bit deeper if you want, but obviously you don't want to ask it to search very, very deep because that will take a long time. <coughs> uh, when, so auto doesn't always work. When it works, it's incredibly convenient because uh, you just say proof auto QED. That's all there is to, to say. Okay, now you can extend it a little bit as I said. So uh, it has a notion of a hint database uh, which tells it here are some things from the global context that you should also consider applying. Uh, and uh, that hint database can be managed by you. So some of the uh, things that we've already seen, some of the, uh, for example, the constructors, conj, intro r, r intro l, uh, for or, uh, are uh, pre-installed by the library where they're defined uh, in the hint database. So auto will always look for those. Uh, when you define something, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, one more thing. You can locally extend the hint database when you, uh, when you use auto. You can say auto using and give the name of a couple of lemmas that, that need to be applied at this point uh, somewhere during the proof search. Uh, you can, so that's, that's kind of temporary uh, extension of the hint database. You can also permanently extend the hint database uh, by these kind of commands, so hint resolve, hint constructors, hint unfold. So hint resolve takes any theorem that you've proved and adds it to the hint database. Uh, hint constructors uh, is a kind of convenience. Uh, so hint constructors T, where T is some inductively defined type, uh, adds all of the constructors. So it's as if you said uh, hint resolve C1, hint resolve C2, and so on for, for each constructor. Uh, and then hint unfold is a little bit different. Uh, it, it doesn't add uh, a theorem, but it, uh, it allows auto to do a little bit of automatic unfolding, uh, which it by default doesn't do as it's doing its proof search. So, uh, so hint unfold uh, may enable some other um, applications. Um, it's also worth knowing that there isn't just one hint database, uh, you can define your own. So, uh, so as you're going along, if you find that there are certain proofs where you need a certain collection of facts very often, uh, but you don't want them cluttering up and slowing down uh, the hint database globally, you can put them in a, a local hint database. So uh, auto is a power tool it has to be used with care uh, because uh, you know it's easy to cut your foot off. Um, but uh, uh, you will you will quickly learn to have a feeling for which sorts of things it's safe to put in the auto uh, hint database and which it isn't. Right. So the the sorts of things that are safe to put in are like constructors of inductively defined data types because they don't apply very often. Uh, whereas Generic theorems like, you know, transitivity uh, would be rather unsafe to put in as that would lead to kind of wild proof search. Okay. Um, one little kind of concrete syntax convenience is uh, when you start a proof, you can say proof with and give a tactic. And then during that proof, you can say dot, dot, dot uh, in place of that tactic. 
uh, and many of the proofs later on uh, will use that by saying proof with auto. Now let's see, where did, where did E auto get explained? I didn't explain E auto. Let me explain E auto. Uh, e auto is a variant of auto that instead of using apply, uses a tactic called E apply. Okay, so now let me explain E apply. Uh, e apply, uh, okay, remember when we discussed apply, uh, we noticed that uh, if there are uninstantiated meta variables after it does its unification thing, it will fail. You might ask yourself, well, why should it fail? Why can't it just remember that there was an uninstantiated unification variable and let me deal with it later? That's what eApply does. So, uh, so if you use eApply in one of those situations where apply would have failed, uh, you will get sub-goals where the statement of the goal uh, involves some, uh, some unification variables. You can recognize them because they begin with a question mark. And these are things that uh, are going to need to be filled in at some point uh, before the proof is finished. So if you get to the end and say QED and there are still uninstantiated meta variables, uninstantiated unification variables, uh, then the QED will fail. So you have to discharge them eventually. But what's convenient is often the very next step you're going to do is going to nail down what that variable must have been. So, uh, so it's, it's often very convenient to leave it uninstantiated for a couple of steps. Okay, so E apply does that, and then E auto uh, uses E apply instead of apply. Uh, why have both auto and E auto? Because E auto sounds much more powerful. Well, power is good sometimes, and speed is good sometimes, and that's why. E auto is much slower than, uh, than auto in general. So I would say uh, my, my sense of what most Calk experts do is they liberally use auto all over the place, uh, but they kind of think before they put an E auto in their proof uh, because that will really slow down uh, how long it takes for Calk to check that file. It's very useful sometimes. Okay. Uh, Another useful one uh, is uh, solve by inversion. Um, this is just a convenience. So, uh, so this is for situations where in the context there's something that if you invert it is going to give you zero sub goals. Uh, and uh, so this just searches through the context trying to invert everything it finds. <coughs> and uh, and if it manages to find one that completely solves the goal, then it's happy. Otherwise, it leaves everything unchanged. Okay, so this is quite convenient sometimes. However, uh, I need to add an even bigger caveat. Uh, this one can be very slow. So uh, I've even heard it argued that, uh, that this one should not be used at all because it's, uh, it's just too, or, or that, that at, least, uh, at least I shouldn't be teaching people to use it uh, wantonly. So you should, you should use it with care because it can slow down your developments. But, uh, but we do use it in our developments here because often it makes things just uh, a lot shorter and clearer. You, you can just say, well, you know, we're in a contradictory state. You figure out why. Uh, here's another one that, that doesn't have a, a speed penalty and, uh, and is often quite useful. It's a, um, it's a, variant, of, uh, a variant of try. Uh, which, so remember, try uh, attempts to use a tactic and if it fails, doesn't do anything. That is, succeeds uh, and does nothing rather than failing. Uh, sometimes that's not what you want. Sometimes you want to try a tactic, but if it doesn't fully, fully solve the goal, uh, it's going to leave your, uh, your goal state in a kind of mangled form that uh, that'll be confusing or you don't actually want to continue in that direction. You just wanted to take one step, and if it didn't work, then step back. And that's what try solve does. Okay, and then the last thing I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, 
in any detail, but just to let you know that it's here, uh, is a tactic called normalize. This one isn't built in. Uh, it's one that we defined. But uh, it's quite useful for uh, animating uh, inductive, inductively defined step relations. So in a little bit more detail, uh, the downside of defining uh, your operational semantics with an inductively defined relation rather than a fixed point is that now you can't experiment with it, right? Uh, because, uh, because every time you want to show that some term evaluates to something or other, you have to do a big, long, laborious proof by hand. Right? So you can perfectly well do it, but it's boring. And, uh, and so you won't do much testing of your, uh, of your operational semantics uh, if you have to do it that way. So this normalize tactic uh, takes an inductive definition, takes a deterministic inductive definition, one that actually defines a partial function, uh, and, uh, and steps it. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I want to say about this file. Here's the definition of normalize, by the way. Uh, it's a few lines of tactic notation script. And <coughs> uh, a general comment about, uh, about hacking in the tactic language is uh, as you begin to be uh, more expert Cock users, uh, you will certainly feel yourself drawn to, uh, to doing this kind of hacking. Um, at the beginning, try not to go nuts with it for two reasons. One, because it's easy to kind of get lost in it and uh, stop understanding what your proofs are about. Uh, and two, uh, it is probably a, a tough contender with tech for world's worst programming language. Uh, designed by a computer scientist. <laughs>